thank you very much. And um, thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Thanks also very much to uh, my colleagues uh, who have majorly contributed to the ideas I'll be uh, talking uh, about today. And thank you also for all the team in the room that's sort of behind the stage that worked very hard to make this all happen. We are living in a, in a world of crisis. Uh, we see unprecedented rates of species extinction, destruction of natural habitats, um, and uh, are starting to undermine uh, the ecosystem services that we all depend on. We um, unfortunately continue to see an, uh, a, a, a trend of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions that keep rising despite the actions of millions of people, uh, people taking to the street today again uh, to fight for more clima climate action. Um, we are now also facing a global health crisis, which have shown how vulnerable our modern health systems uh, as well as our modern lifestyles are. And finally, the aftermath of that, we are now facing also an economic crisis with um, economic uh, growth rates sharply declining uh, in many countries around the world with mass unemployment on the rise in many countries around the world and with inequalities rising even further as a consequence of this crisis. So in other words, um, something needs to change. The world that we currently live in doesn't work for many people around the globe, it doesn't work for the environment, and we're undermining the functioning of our planet. So in this situation, we're now asking the question about a turning point, and in our view, there's two general strategies in which one can respond to these multiple crises. Uh, there's, of course, a transformation towards a more sustainable economic and societal system, uh, and then the sort of business as usual response in terms of getting a recovery going, getting economic growth going again, uh, and thereby returning to the growth path. And unfortunately, uh, in our perspective, a lot of the policies that are being proposed in many countries around the world are mainly focusing on that recovery strategy, getting back to uh, the status quo, getting back to uh, economic growth. Uh, in, and in that context, almost there are some suggestions to also scale down environmental ambitions. Sort of, we don't have time for this now, this is not a good time, now we really need to go back and uh, get growth going. So in a sense, from our perspective, we see that as a kind of growth obsession uh, persisting. Um, Mockery has coined the phrase of the culture of growth. Uh, and in our view, that um, uh, risks reinforcing existing path dependencies. But it also leads to resistance to the kinds of transformative policies that we think are needed. So in that sense, the pandemic provides a sort of a backbone to all of these different crises that were already going on beforehand. Uh, but the corona uh, crisis and the uh, economic situation that we now find ourselves in has put a stark uh, light again on this question of economic growth and whether it's compatible with environmental protection. Of course, this has been a long-ranging debate, at least since the Meadows et al. report in, uh, from the Club of Rome in 1972. Um, we've also heard from Thomas already that at the, the founding conference of the Institute for Ecological Economy Research, uh, this was one of the topics, or this was the title in terms of ways out of the industrial growth dilemma. So this is certainly a topic we've been uh, trying to tackle over many, many years collectively. But the empirical reality out there is that so far we haven't managed to achieve absolute decoupling of uh, environmental pressures from economic growth. Uh, and also that growth is strongly linked to all sorts of functioning of uh, fundamental social institutions that we have, including the welfare state, uh, and therefore enable uh, a good um, a life. In this debate, uh, from our point of view, there are two very uh, entrenched and, and dominant positions. There's, of course, the green growth uh, perspective and the degrowth position. And if we wanted to map these uh, two um, positions uh, against two dimensions. One is the question about decoupling. Is decoupling uh, possible to an extent uh, that we uh, live within uh, planetary boundaries? And the second question of what about growth? What is economic growth for? And do we need further growth, especially in OECD countries, to 
um, further uh, quality of life. And of course, um, the green growth um, uh, position is to uh, answer both of these questions with yes, to say yes, we uh, uh, absolutely coupling is possible, and yes, we need also in OECD countries further economic growth uh, to improve quality of life, lift people out of poverty, reduce social inequalities, and so on and so forth. The degrowth um, movement uh, and academic community um, has for a long time argued that uh, degrowth um, is the answer because decoupling isn't possible, partly because of rebound effects and other uh, systemic effects, but also that um, GDP uh, growth isn't really uh, the answer to a lot of the social uh, problems uh, we're facing. Colleagues here at the Institute uh, have developed uh, a third alternative position, which we call the precautionary post-growth um, position, which basically says we're not sure whether absolute decoupling is possible. So far, there isn't a lot of empirical evidence that this can happen, um, and also arguing that GDP isn't a good measure of social welfare anyways. Uh, and uh, there are also question marks about whether achieving the environmental ambitions that we want uh, will actually allow economic growth in OECD countries to continue. Uh, and so from a precautionary perspective, since there is, so this is a common established principle in environmental policy, um, and so from that perspective, um, it is uh, then uh, the right approach to say, because of these uncertainties, uh, we uh, adopt a post-growth position so that we're prepared uh, for the future. From this position, we've derived sort of four recommendations uh, for policymakers. One is uh, the, a very deep and fundamental cultural change away from this culture of growth that Mocker described in his book to a culture of sustainability. The second point, uh, environmental economists for a long time have argued that we need to set uh, effective economic framework conditions, sort of uh, internalizing the externalities. So from our point of view, that's surely uh, part of the solution, but only part and uh, not the whole uh, answer to the question. We are very much arguing in favor of experimenting, exploring new paths of societal developments uh, with post-growth alternatives, alternative economic systems, uh, experimental spaces, uh, participatory search processes, and so on and so forth, but also new approaches in innovation and research policy so that we fund the kind of alternative thinking that we need uh, to explore a post-growth society. And lastly, the point about um, Currently, our social institutions, including the welfare system, very much depending on the continuation of growth. Um, so our point here is to say, well, we need to make sure that these um, very important institutions are uh, set up in ways that they are uh, less dependent on growth um, so that we reduce past dependencies and thereby make a contribution to enabling a transition towards a sustainable future. So. This is a position we developed uh, about um, two years ago. We've since been working to um, develop this further. So there are two new uh, ideas that we want to bring in today and that we want to discuss with participants during the conference. One is uh, complementing the focus on precaution, also with uh, a resilience, a broader resilience uh, strategy. And secondly, to integrate some of the insights from the literature on sustainability transitions uh, about thinking of processes of um, systemic change. So in terms of the Resilience. Um, in the 2018 report, we argued that um, uh, precaution, in the sense I described it earlier, is, is very important, um, but also that it needs to be part of a broader resilience strategy, which includes economic, environmental, and social objectives, but also is fit for this uh, post growth uh, world. Um, and I think the corona um, crisis has shown that our current uh, economic and social systems are very vulnerable uh, to disruption um, and that we therefore uh, make this point now much more strongly than in the past to say, well, we need to have systems that are much more resilient, but the question is how? Uh, and uh, we don't have a lot of answers uh, to this question, so I'm um, very keen to uh, learn more from our participants. Uh, we have a, a workshop session later on that focuses on this theme uh, and to learn from ideas, for example, in the literature on foundational economics, uh, but also the literature on social ecological uh, transitions, which have dealt with these questions for some time now. Um, 
The second extension, if you want, of our position uh, is to integrate more insights uh, from the sustainability transitions literature about these processes and dynamics of systemic change. Why do we need that? Well, we think that uh, a lot of uh, the th thinking about alternative economic systems and also in the degrowth movement uh, is very good in terms of the alternative system uh, the, that is imagined, but isn't very good in having a consistent theory about, uh, to think about how we actually get to that sort of society. Um, so the, the, the literature on sustainability transitions has developed a range of strategies um, in terms of supporting um, strategic niche management as one of the approaches, transition management, transformative innovation policy with Johan Schott we'll talk about later on, and also transformative environmental policy, which I've already mentioned and which I hope Cora Christoph in her talk will touch upon later. And we also see that there are a number of uh, fruitful linkages with the position um, uh, we've outlined. Um, and there's a whole range of um, contributions that deal with questions of uh, grassroots innovation, or also transformative social innovation processes uh, that are very fruitful um, in terms of further developing the post-growth approach. In terms of uh, this literature, one of the um, key frameworks uh, in that literature uh, is the multi-level perspective, which takes a long-term um, perspective on processes of structural change in uh, individual systems, such as the energy system or the mobility system uh, or the agricultural system, and um, tries to um, conceptualize the processes of change as an interaction between three different levels. So there's the, the kind of uh, dominant configuration of how we supply the services, uh, for example, in the electricity uh, sector with sort of um, fossil fuel uh, power plants, centralized, um, uh, that produce a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. And then we can think of uh, this coming under pressure from two directions. One, from the landscape level, so shocks, but also political movements, putting pressure on the existing configurations, demanding more actions on climate change, is putting pressure on this configuration and uh, has an effect on the strategies of, of actors involved in that system. And then, of course, there are also uh, alternatives emerging in so-called niche in the sense of, uh, for example, renewable energy technologies, but also business models and how to um, make this work in terms of cooperatives, for example. Um, and so we think that uh, we need that kind of uh, level of uh, thinking about system change. In, in terms of um, policy strategy, so there's a whole of, as I mentioned on the last slide, there's a whole range of, of policy relevant approaches that have been taken up, for example, by the Dutch government in terms of um, using that as an approach to manage their energy transition. Uh, this is also informed thinking by uh, 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 the, um, the European Environment Agency. Um, and so we've, we think that there are a lot of interesting policy messages coming out of this literature. Some of them are uh, very much align also with our thinking in terms of the post-growth position. For example, this idea about the need for supporting experiments and social innovation obviously links to our recommendation number three. Um, thinking about the framework conditions and sort of putting the regime under pressure links to our uh, recommendation number two. And then uh, lastly, at the landscape level, thinking about processes of cultural change and uh, moving away from the culture of growth uh, and the growth independence of the social welfare systems uh, and other societal systems uh, is also very important. Um, another sort of big picture theorizing about these processes that have an even longer uh, uh, historical perspective is the deep transitions approach by Johann Schott, which is very much focusing on dominant rules and how they guide uh, the behavior of actors. So this is really about the industrial revolution uh, and the shift towards mass uh, production and mass consumption as one of the guiding rules of actors' behavior in the mobility system, in the energy system, um, in um, um, the food system, uh, and uh, they're starting to develop there some thinking about the second deep transition away from industrial modernity and what of some of the guiding principles uh, could be there. For example, uh, ideas around the circular economy. So I, I will not talk much more about this position because we're very fortunate to have Johan Schott with us today who, who will talk about that more. So. Um, the only thing left for me is then to conclude with these four points to say the world is in crisis, we need to act now, so we need to make this year 2020 the turning point. Um, from our point of view, the decoupling of uh, uh, econo uh, economic growth and uh, environmental destruction is uncertain, um, therefore we propose the uh, post-growth uh, position 
uh, as a, a guide for policy. Um, we have argued this position um, needs to be further developed with regard to two aspects, resilience, as well as thinking about uh, processes of systemic change through the sustainability transitions uh, perspective. Uh, and we really hope that with our discussions today, with our further development, with the research at our institute, that this will produce new knowledge and more effective strategies for transitions towards more resilient, more sustainable economic and societal systems for a whole range of actors from policy, civil society and activism. Thank you very much.